Welcome, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Web3 Native Podcast. I'm your host, Shikai, and today we are honored to be joined by one of the pioneers and OGs of NFT and crypto gaming, Gabby from YGG. Hello, Gabby. Shikai, thanks for having me. All right. So there's a lot to discuss, and I think there's a lot of really exciting recent developments. So let's dive right into it. Uh, would you like to start with perhaps just a one-liner intro of yourself and YGG? Okay, so um, I'm a game developer. Um, so that's my background for the last 18 years. I got into crypto in 2018 and NFTs. And now we are, uh, I would say, leading the forefront of what is now um, the play-to-earn movement with uh, Yield Guild Games for YGG. Awesome. We're going to go a lot deeper into what play to earn and what YGG stand for. But before we go there, I love to always go back to the history and the origins and the motivations of how you got here today, right? Because I think a great part about crypto is such diverse backgrounds and the different journeys that we all have. So how did you actually come from a game developer background to the early days when we were working with you when you were <laughs> doing Alto, yeah. right? And then moved That's on right. to YGG, right? So uh, we'd love to hear especially any of the, you know, the victories, the pitfalls, the challenges and learnings that got you where you are today. Yeah, so I've been a game developer for uh, 18 years now, so since 2003. Started um, our game studio, Altitude Games, in um, 2014. And 2017, we started looking into Ethereum to see how uh, smart contracts, so we just learned about the concept of smart contracts and programmable money. And we were trying to see how that could eventually disrupt the game industry. And um, during that time, we learned about um, NFTs when CryptoKitties came out in late 2017. And it was there that was really the kind of aha moment for us. Like we had this feeling that NFTs were going to change the world. And yes, like it's, it's interesting that you, uh, you discuss Alto because we worked with you on that back then. Um, we launched that, I would say it was like March 2018, and we're trying to get funding for it. Like ultimately, um, that concept didn't work out and it had to pivot into what is now Outplay Games. But I was actually looking at some of the pitches and photos from 2018, and we were already talking about NFTs that had interoperability. We were already talking about the metaverse. So it's actually the same concepts that we are talking about today. It was just that, I guess, the, the, kind of, it, the world wasn't ready for it back then, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, I've always wondered, right, like, what was it about the timing back then that didn't work out, right? And, and what has changed? So like, what what were you doing while the timing was not right? Or did you contribute to bringing about this current uh, era as well? Yeah. Yeah. So I think the metaverse as a concept, it requires several things to be in place. So one is that widespread acceptance of NFTs as a kind of store of unique value. If, um, if cryptocurrencies are a store of, I would say, fungible value, an NFT is a store of unique value, be it a game item, a cat, an axie, or a piece of land. And then you need... Um, unique experiences to be built around that. So, for example, the Central Land, the game of Axie Infinity, the Sandbox. So you need to have really good experiences back then. And then you move to kind of, a, I guess, a metaverse concept, meaning that you have these assets across interconnected games and virtual worlds where um, the assets themselves are owned by um, the, the player, uh, and then they move towards these certain worlds. So I think um, the metaverse as a concept was like, it was really great. The, the concept has been around since the 90s with Snow Crash, right? Which uh, was actually inspired like a whole generation of um, entrepreneurs in NFTs right now. But I think from a technology and a product standpoint, like 2018 was way too early, even in 2021 where we're getting started and we've seen a lot of success with Yield Guild, with Axie Infinity, um, with stuff like Decentraland. I, I still think we're still kind of really early in the metaverse journey. Yeah, indeed. It's so early. And and I think while we are at a time where it feels that we are experiencing great growth, which we're going to get to in a minute, I think having gone through that period of like 2018, 2019, where the timing was not quite right, right, it must have been such a valuable experience, I think, for a lot of entrepreneurs in the space, right? How did it feel to be building in that at that time? And what were some of the sentiments and most challenging parts? Yeah, I think... Like being early is a different experience for an entrepreneur versus an investor. For an investor, 
you don't want to invest in something three years too early. Maybe you're investing in something a year too early, or if you're lucky, just about a trend is about to take off. You, you don't want to be investing after it takes off. But for a builder, you need to be kind of out there in the trenches building it like even maybe years or even decades before something really takes off. And, you know, how really that's how it felt since um, we were there in 2018. Like the, I would say NFTs were so compelling that I couldn't imagine myself really doing anything else. And it was really tough. Like we, you know, a very hard time to get the funding. Um, games like Axie had um, less than 500 DAU even last year in, uh, uh, in early 2020. Um, so there, there was really kind of a small core of people who really believed in this and stuck it through, kept building, kept iterating, small core communities that really believe in these projects. And these were the things that kind of got us through the, the bear market. Yeah, I, I can almost feel the conviction coming from you, right? Like the <laughs> tenacity, just like stick it through. And I think I can really sense that, you know, with many of the communities as well, it's the ones that the people that would stuck through with you and you know they're there for the conviction that you know that, okay, when things are going good, that these people were the ones that stuck around and therefore uh, deserve to be recognized. Of course, not to discount the people who, who are coming in from the new age as well, like in the new yeah. wave of growth. But certainly I think it, it feels different to be with someone that you know is like kind of battle tested uh, throughout all these years. Yeah. That's right. So. Fast forward to today then, uh, let's discuss some of the incredible metrics of growth that we have seen, I think primarily yep. in XC Infinity and perhaps more around uh, Yield Guild itself as well as uh, play to earn in general. Okay, um, let's talk about Axie first because um, Axie is definitely the game that is leading the pack in terms of play to earn. So Axie introduced the SLP system, um, the SLP token last year in 2020. And it's a, it's a game resource that can be earned when you win matches inside the game. And then you have to burn it as a resource when you breed two axes to create a new one. And you need three axes to play the game. So when you buy three axes to start playing the game to earn, someone needs to be burning those um, SLP tokens. So this drives a kind of really good crypto economic loop that um, creates um, demand for uh, SLP token as long as there are new players that are coming in. And this has been the biggest driver for growth for Axie. They were at, I would say, around 500 DAU in, I would say, like around September, August or September last year. Fast forward to November, it was around 5,000. In January, around 15,000. And then fast forward to day to July, it's 500,000 DAU, which is really, really insane. And it's driving a lot of growth in the marketplace. So. The marketplace for, of Axie has been seeing 20 to 40 million dollars in volume, like almost each day um, in July. It was up from maybe three to five million last month. And yeah, like it, it's really the first true breakout application. And here in my home country in the Philippines, there are actually more searches for Axie Infinity than crypto or Ethereum. Incredible. So that's kind of like some real world adoption right there. And also like benchmarking against other uh, NFT marketplaces, XC, as I understand, is already like the number one in terms of volume. And also yeah. in terms of uh, crypto protocol, also the number one in terms of protocol revenue, right? Given the play to earn yeah. model uh, that, that actually brings some tokens back to the treasury. Yep, that's right. So um, Axie itself, like it's brought in a lot of money that is not there specifically to invest in crypto. It's there to invest in the Axie ecosystem. So Axie has been doing more fee run uh, than Bitcoin, for example, um, which is, yeah, really insane if you think about it. Mm -hmm. And so for YGG then, as part of the core, I guess, component of the XE ecosystem, I presume then uh, your growth has also been trailing uh, XE. Yeah. Yeah. So YGG is a play to earn gaming guild. And the reason that we discuss the games first before YGG, like YGG c could not have happened without games to build on top of, right? Um, and we did start with what is called the scholarship program in Axie Infinity. So the scholarship program is um, the act of uh, entities that are lending out axes to people who want to play the game and earn money, but uh, don't have the upfront um, capital to do so. So we breed axes and then lend them out and we earn a portion of the revenue share that is generated. So um, the revenue share works like this. The scholar or the player earns 70%. 
percent of the SLT that we have community managers from different um, local communities around the world that manage and retra- uh, recruit and train these scholars, and they get 20 percent of the rev share. And us, the guild YGG, we get 10 percent of the SLT that is um, uh, generated. So we've uh, generated lifetime more than 27 million SLT, which is over $7 million um, last time I checked. Um, the majority of that has been in the last two months. Uh, we are now up to 3,300 Axie scholars. Um, so yeah, so that so, so I mean, these are not the statistics for me. These are 3,300 lives and their families' lives that are getting better. And if you see, like, a lot of people have been able to pay down debts, um, pay for food for their family, pay medical bills, um, buy a car, sometimes buy a house for themselves. So the stories are really incredible. And there's a lot of kind of um, pay it forward mentality wherein, you know, once you're a scholar, you might graduate by your own axes, help other people in need. And this is really my favorite part of the community. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's so much more people centric and like livelihoods that are being affected. And I think the most touching point is looking at the documentary, how like everyone from uh, overseas workers who are coming back, uh, people who are affected by the lockdown, elderly couples who, who really uh, are super thankful uh, for a play to earn model. So I think there's so much uh, importance that, uh, and in fact, the entire YGG's thesis and the reason for existence rests upon the model of play to earn, right? So I think we, we definitely need to discuss that in a bit more detail. Uh, sure. how, do you, how do you see this the, the rise of play to earn as a, I guess, gaming model? Uh, and how does that compare to the current dominant model or rather emerging one, which is free to play, right? I think like uh, yeah. we have kind of like games that have kind of figured it out that, you know, you can uh, come and just join for free so it's more inclusive and then they monetize yeah. later on for uh, your engagement. Whereas play to earn kind of introduces a barrier up front for people to before they can even play and of course ygg has uh, used that to as an opportunity but do you see what other differences and comparisons would you see between free to play and play to earn yeah i think the biggest difference is that in free to play it's still really the developer that is selling stuff to to players right and even though you know as a player i can play for free and um, I don't have to pay, and then some people might convert, and that forms most of the revenue. That that revenue really flows um, more towards um, the the developers. Whereas play to earn is a combination of NFT, DeFi, and the concept of a player-owned economy. So, um, for example, um, you with with play to earn, you have NFTs that produce yield in the form of a reward token. In this case, SLP. So. The team Axie, the Axie team itself, they don't own any SLPs. They don't, they don't earn any revenue directly from it. Um, it's uh, players who are earning SLP that sell them for Ether or Fiat. And then it's the people who are buying SLP because they want to breed Axies to sell to new players that are buying the SLP. So this means that the Sky Mavis team, the creators of Axie, they actually do not subsidize the price of uh, of SLP token itself. And that is, I, I would say, the, the most incredible part of this growth is that there has been um, constant demand for the SLP token, even though it is not subsidized by, by the developers. And this is quite a novel use of um, kind of putting DeFi into game design and then with NFTs that has really allowed for the, the rise of, uh, of play to earn. And one thing to add is that in a play to earn system, um, you have a marketplace where you're taking a small cut of the fees. So, for example, if in free to play, the developer usually gets um, basically all of the revenue minus a platform fee of 30% if you're that you give out to Apple or Google. In play to earn, you kind of control the ecosystem. You have a marketplace, but you're only taking, in many cases, less than 5%. So you're letting um, your players earn most of the revenue that goes to the marketplace, and you're taking a much smaller cut of that but you're growing the whole ecosystem a lot more because you're allowing your community, your player base to make money. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think there's this very core ethos of like community owned and player owned so, such that it's not the de- developers themselves that are benefiting uh, only from this, but everybody who who plays and uh, uh, to earn, right? Uh, although, I mean, just to challenge it a little bit further, right? Do we actually need the upfront cost? Like why not make it you know free to start off and then right. you know you have to 
pay to maybe level up or you know become more powerful, like to unlock certain features. That's the kind of the core concept of uh, free to play, right? Does it have to be at odds? Can we have uh, you know a community owned or player owned free to play game that uh, is still monetizable? Or has is this kind of like the set model already? Um, I think we're still very early on in play to earn, and I think a, a lot of these models would kind of blend with some of the best practices from free to play. But going that back to your point, um, axes are, are expensive because you can earn good money from them, right? If um, if axes were free, then everyone would try to get one and earn money, and then they wouldn't be worth much, right? So mm -hmm. there is a kind of barrier in cost that allows the reward token SLP to have value. Because if anyone in the world could taxi easily, there would be much value to the resulting um, SLP token, right? Mm, yeah, so in a way, you kind of need a, a barrier uh, and scarcity, actually, right, in order to Absolutely. generate value. Yeah, and I think that's that's the, the core of, of that compared to something that's that's completely free. So definitely see the, the wave towards there. Uh, the other part about it is, like you mentioned, once the value is created, then that's where the magic happens, right? Uh, and that also attracts a lot of people who start to play it full time and like almost kind of dependent uh, on XC for livelihood or other play to earn games later on as well. And I think we have seen quite a few precedents where, you know, with uh, the platforms like Uber, Grab, Gojek, the moment it becomes a full time thing, it kind of changes the dynamics, right? From being a side gig of like ride sharing, uh, those car riders became, the drivers became like full time and they had to optimize for like, you know, like toilet break, some crazy stuff. <laughs> so, how does going full time into play to earn change the dynamics for the players, right? Is it still a kind of a, a good job, so to speak? Um, so, I guess I, we have to preface that by saying that. Um, the there is no double earnings in this economy because um, like it really depends on what the price of SLP, for example, which can be quite volatile because it is traded publicly on exchanges. So recently, the demand for SLP has been very high, which has resulted in uh, salaries that are frankly like maybe three to five times that of minimum wage. However, for me, like, like that's not an endorsement of you to like quit your job and do this full time. You really have to understand the ecosystem first and know what you're getting into. And if, maybe if you're playing this part-time and you're getting maybe just as much as your salary or even higher, then it, it's like a great hobby to have, right? And there are people who have kind of moved from their jobs and then are doing this full-time. But I think it really needs to take an understanding of how the Axie economy works, how crypto works, how NFTs work, and what kind of risks are inherent. So we don't recommend asking people to kind of blindly jump uh, jump in and say, hey, like this is your new job. And yes, like this is a form of employment, I would say, but it's a form of self-employment. If you, if you play the game, you put the work in, you win games, you may earn some reward tokens and they may be worth some money and pretty good money in many cases, but like don't think that this will be like your next stable job for the next 10, 20 years. Like that doesn't exist. That's good advice. Because I almost see kind of two different groups that could spring up, maybe two or three different groups, right? Uh, like you said, one the most common one should be kind of like casual gamers who are rewarded for what they do, but it's not their full-time job and it shouldn't be. And there should be a big base of this like casual gamers. And we could see some of the really professional people who are almost like esports athletes who really yeah. figure out the meta game and then like they, they dedicate their, their lives to it. And then maybe a, a third category related to that where like they really know the games and, and therefore they can like uh, find new games, invest in those assets and then be and participate in those ecosystems in that way. Well, there's also another one, which is those people who don't have a lot of good, re um, really good economic options in life. So, for example, if you're unemployed, underemployed, or you're in a country that doesn't offer much local economic opportunities. So this is a chance because the game is borderless. As long as you're able to access the game, get the reward token and cash it out from crypto to fiat, this is a chance for people who are actually uh, basically suffering from lack of choice. Um, a lot of people, some of them in the Philippines, Indonesia, Venezuela, for example, like they're earning far more than they would with their local um, job opportunities, especially in the rural areas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, especially with the, the kind of like currency arbitrage, right? It's insane the, the amount that they can earn compared to what they typically have. Uh, and 
I think this this is a point that is worth considering. Like you mentioned, it is quite volatile as well. And we want to talk about uh, for play to earn itself, right? How sustainable it is, right? For people to expect this kind of like higher levels of income. I think currently, as, as we have mentioned, the growth metrics are, are insane and a lot of new users are coming in. And in a way, play to earn depends on new players who are coming in, like new scholars, new investors who are buying up new axes and therefore a breeding economy continues to, to uh, live on and like the marketplace continues to be vibrant and the whole and the demand for SLP continues to grow. So it's, it almost seems that all play to earn games right now are, are dependent on growth and uh, it is uh, paid for by new players, uh, guild investors, speculators, uh, like a lot of crypto projects actually. <laughs> yeah. So um, is, is this any different? Like, how will this play out when, I don't know, some sort of plateau or will we see some curve flattening? Uh, where, where do people go? So this growth loop is actually similar to most web businesses going back from Facebook to Google to kind of Dropbox, even Gmail. Um, a lot of these companies use some kind of growth loop to really um, encourage people to sign up for the for, for service, right? So for PayPal, it was like you send an email, then you can get like $10, $10 in your account. So I see the kind of Axie growth loop by scholarships as possibly the best growth loop ever created, better than the Dropbox or Hotmail growth loops, which are pretty legendary in startup circles. But I would say that this is not the end game of the product. If you look at the products like um, Hotmail or PayPal, they've stopped offering $10 right, to, to people who are coming in. It's just not sustainable anymore. But they've built out the product or the service where there's a lot of people uh, that, that can do things inside the game. And it's the same with Axie. Um, there's a lot of things in the pipeline, new types of battles. The land system is going to come out and there is a plan to introduce um, basically an SDK where other games can build um, experiences on top of the same axes. Plus there's a huge esports component. People are sponsoring prizes. So I see the kind of current growth as uh, the early phase of a growth loop. I still think we're early at 500K DAU. Um, I think that there's, uh, you know, if, if you think about like how many people in the world are willing to play video games for money and earn maybe 500 to a thousand dollars a month, that's probably a lot of people around the world. I estimate that to be maybe one to two billion people before growth starts slowing down. So us at 500 K, I think we're just barely getting started, but you know, it's inevitable as with any kind of business that acquires new users, the growth matures eventually and people will have to find something to do in the ecosystem so all businesses are like that and you know theme parks are like that movie movie theaters are like that facebook is like that and like axie or other play to earn games are no different once you've acquired these users there must be a, a reason for them to stay and keep spending for the economy itself to be vibrant mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it, as we see in the, the the gaming universe as well, right? There are games which are like stickier when they have uh, social elements, when they have like a meta yeah. game that continues to evolve, right? But different balancing mechanics. Uh, and in the play to earn model, of course, you need to have the tokenomics as well. So I almost sense that there's a certain playbook that is being uh, emerging out of like the play to earn model, especially from Axie's example uh, in your mind. And of course, there are a few other games that uh, YGG is already invested in, right? So in your mind, yeah. is, is there already kind of a template of the necessary minimum ingredients for a viable play to earn model, right? So like a, a good a tokenomics that has incentivizes growth and, and earnings while having some burn, uh, should it be like separate into governance mm -hmm. and utility token, uh, must be a PVP socialized gameplay that is like a never ending rather than having a, a set meta that to be figured out or a single player? Um, so I don't think that there is one playbook right now. Um, Axios definitely kind of um, really broken in the lead and kind of really opened the playbook that that works for virality. Um, I expect games to be slightly different because of their mechanics. But when we look to invest in play to earn games as YGG, here's a couple of things that we look at. First, um, we are looking for some kind of play to earn tokenomics look with loop, um, which means that there is some kind of reward token that is being earned from the NFTs that um, that you have. Second, we, um, 
we're looking for some kind of guild play or delegation system because mm -hmm. us as a guild, our business model is to invest in these NFTs and have our players actually play these games. So us as the as the kind of core team of the guild, we're not sitting around playing games all day. We're investing in NFTs and we turn them over to the community so that the community can play games and earn um, um, an income from it. And we take a small fee out of that and we create the platform, the smart contracts, we do the investments, we provide a social structure around it. That's the kind of work that we do as a guild. Um, but the players have to be able to earn something from it because that's kind of the core of what we do as a play to earn guild. Um, and lastly, um, we also really like it if, you know, we, if we add value to a game by investing in assets, by providing our community members to play it, uh, we like it if we can capture that value in the form of a governance token. Mm -hmm. So, for example, with Axie as well, apart from our NFT and Axie investments um, and land, we also bought a lot of the AXS token. And that has uh, rewarded us quite well because as we have invested in Axie along with other people and the value of um, of the economy has grown, a lot of that value has flown back, uh, flowed back to the AXS token. So let's let's go to YGG now, right? To specifics of YGG. Uh, now there are so many facets of of play to earn that we can go into. Uh, be it you know investing in the assets themselves, you know playing uh, the governance token and being involved in the, in those games. Now. The core business of YGG, as I understand it, is still the delegation part, right? Of uh, having these assets and letting the providing scholarships for new players to come and play the games and therefore earn and share revenue of that. So, uh, would you like to walk us through then the the, the core model of YGG as as you have, and why do you decide to go after this uh, area rather than the others, or is this kind of like you tried everything and this is the one that sticks because it works the best? Okay, so. Going back to Axie, um, the scholarship system actually was, I would say, discovered by the community. It wasn't, um, it wasn't actually a feature that was um, planned by the developers themselves, but there was an interesting quirk in the architecture of the game in that there was a separate login system, username, password-based login from a wallet-based login. So if you log in via the wallet, then you could move around your your assets, your NFTs. If you log in via username, password, you can access your account, you can play the game, but you couldn't move the assets. And some people in the community figured out that you can use this to basically rent out your uh, account to another person, give them the username, password, have them access and play the game and earn money without fear of them running away with the assets. So it was really quite a novel thing that, um, the community discovered and that that was how the scholarship system was born a lot of people came in the game and basically were looking for ax cheap axes because they couldn't afford to buy the axes up front and these people um, started um, to lend out these accounts so that they could play the game and earn money without having to buy axes and uh, when we saw this what we did was we wanted to build a scaled up version of this so we came up with basically um, a, a, a system where we have different managers from around the world. So these scholarship managers, they're community members. They're not employees of the guild. They are basically their own, um, their own entrepreneurs. And these community managers are around the world. We have a few from the Philippines, Indonesia, India, Venezuela, Brazil, Thailand, and they're they're in charge of recruiting and training scholars in their area and teaching them how to play and earn money. Right. And in return, um, they get a percentage of the revenue share. So 70 percent of um, of the SLP earned goes to the player or the scholar, 20 percent to the community manager and 10 percent to YGG. So now you have people feel like they're they are their own entrepreneurs across the stack. The scholars are earning money for themselves and they earn a majority of the SLP that they generate. A community manager that is good can handle a few hundred people and earn 20% out of their few hundred scholars, which is a fantastic business for them. And it empowers them. It it kind of gives a business model to being a, a good community leader, which has actually been hard to do before. And for us, the Guild, because we have um, 19 managers, 3,300 scholars, even though if we take the smallest cut, we're actually able to really scale this and help the most amount of people from around the world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. And at the core, YGG as a guild is 
pretty much like a DAO, right? It's a collection of people, like yeah. you said, who are accomplishing different roles and being able to make it a sustainable model for all of these roles, the, the scholars who play the game, the community managers who manage the game. Uh, and of course, I think not to forget, I think there, there should be some guild leaders who, who look at, you know, which games to play, right? Or yeah. what kind of assets to invest in and, and therefore what, and what could be their strategies there as well. So uh, how, how do you then recruit that power or is that uh, basically the core team yourself and, you know, the 10, 20 people? No, no, we have a very vibrant community that is interested in all sorts of play to earn games. So if you go to our Discord server, there's, I think, over 30 games that our community is tracking. And if, if we're not tracking them, they usually bug us like, hey, why don't you have a channel for this game? And if enough people bug us, we add, we add a channel and people start discussing it. And so what that does is that we're able to see what games our community is interested in. And if we think that there's enough, I would say, activity in a certain game, then we go ahead and investigate the uh, possibility of investing directly in these assets. So it officially becomes kind of a, a YJG partnered game when we do that. We don't, uh, we don't invest for all of the games there, but even some games, they come to us, we do an AMA for them, we get our community interested in their sale, or uh, in one of their promotions. But yeah, it's different when we come in because we invest um, maybe something like 50 to 100K USD on assets and then lend these out to our players. Usually it requires us to identify someone from the player community as being our game lead. So our game leads are typically from the community and not from uh, not the core team ourselves because these game leads are the ones that are organizing our community to play the game to add value, to accrue value to our assets, to earn money from it. And we just provide the kind of DAO infrastructure, the smart contracts, the the the, uh, the financial support and the social support as well in terms of the community for these um, kind of mini guilds inside our larger guild to be successful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there's the, the overall YGG guild and then there are the sub guilds or the sub DAOs for each particular game. And that's super interesting because uh, I like to bring in like some in imagery or analogies as well, right? Of like how how do people or how do games think about the role of YGG in the entire play to earn ecosystem, right? Uh, to me, it sounds like uh, YGG acts like uh, uh, an amplifier of the of the growth mechanics or the growth loop that they have put in place. So it's up to the game designers or the, the founding team to then put in place or design that, that game loop. And then YG will come and actually utilize that and in fact, kind of maximize it, yeah. uh, push it to its limits so that the people who want to join can earn and the people who want to invest uh, in, in the assets themselves can then make use of the growth. Yeah, that's right. So um, the, YGG is not really one guild, think of it as like dozens of little guilds that are interested in doing different things in the metaverse. And you're right, we do uh, like to amplify different games because when we come in, we invest in the NFT assets, we may invest in the uh, in the governance token, we, let, we get our community come in, so our players get a daily uh, DAU boost when they come in. So we see ourselves as a core ally of these play to earn games to kind of help them get jump started and have a long-term good partner in growing out their game economy and that's very important for us that when we partner in a game we're actually we're always thinking about this in terms of the long-term growth of, of each game's economy mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and the interesting part is also that uh like you mentioned many of the scholars then turn into the managers turn into the strategists and find different player in games so it's and many of them could also earn or be owners of their game itself by having the governance token, right? So it seems to be really porous yeah. and like overlapping in terms of persona. Uh, but I do think still there are some behaviors that are kind of specific to each group, right? And I would love to dive a bit deeper into each of them. So one persona, of course, is the, the scholars themselves and the managers, and their goal is to earn as much as possible by playing this particular game, right? No, uh, no. And, so how do we how do we actually see this evolving, right? Because if I think of this to the nth degree, we're looking at a bit kind of like speedrunners who are like finding these bugs and exploits even <laughs> to to like really maximize like their high scores and so on. Or or are we looking at more kind of like a, a, a large kind of a labor pool, <laughs> for lack of a better word, to kind of like farm this thing on a continuous basis? Is it like a min maxing thing or like a scale kind of thing? It's more uh, like the scale. So we, we refer to what we provide to games as player liquidity. 
Um, and player liquidity is really important because um, any any virtual world or multiplayer game needs a like certain minimum um, amount of players to be fun to play. Like if I'm in a multiplayer battle game and there's only 10 people I'm playing against, like it's not fun. So we actually provide the hard part, I think, of providing human liquidity um, um, to these games. And for these players, it's good because they actually have the choice of playing whatever games they want to play that would kind of serve their needs in maybe in terms of fun, in terms of earning. Um, yeah. Mm, I see, I see. Well, this interesting idea, kind of like a player liquidity. Uh, of course, not to reduce people to like just players, right? But but indeed, I think that's that's the uh, at the higher level how the mechanism works. Yeah, uh, yeah, not at all. So it's it's really yeah. thinking about um, Yield Guild itself as a kind of primary recruiter or job board for the metaverse. It's allowing people um, to come in and experience the economic opportunities in the metaverse for the first time. And we remove the barrier of the upfront cost so that they can come in, start earning money when, and basically as a player, as a content creator, maybe as a level designer, as a game creator, we provide these opportunities that are available um, to these people. Yeah. Absolutely. So the other group that I like to dive into is the investors, right? Because in order to right. play, you need to have assets. Well, for XE, uh, right? For XEs themselves, or it could be land or other types of avatars and items uh, for yep. other games. So for these investors, they actually have many options, right? Like they could uh, hold uh, YGG tokens directly, right. uh, which could be used uh, in the treasury to, to buy assets or invest in games. They can hold the sub DAO tokens or the sub guild tokens, right. which is specific for a game. Uh, they can also just get the NFT assets and maybe in the future stake with YGG directly, uh, or they can hold the game governance tokens directly uh, rather than you know go with YGG, right? So how do investors? compare between these different options, you know, what is the most effective strategy or maybe like a right. different risk profile? How do you think about yeah. it? Yeah, definitely. Um, and that's a great question. It really depends on what kind of investor you are and how you would want to look at, I would say the macro of play to earn and the metaverse itself versus the micro of each individual game that we're playing. If I am an investor that just wants exposure to the entire space, then you're probably just buying the YGG token as a proxy for all of the assets and fees and activity that is um, happening in the metaverse that, that YGG participates in. However, um, as you said, like each game will have its own sub DAO, each DAO will, sub DAO will have its own token, and that allows you to get, I would say, more specific exposure to a certain class of assets that we have for a particular game. So if you're the kind of investor that is looking for, I would say, ARB opportunities, you might take a look at the different sub DAOs that we have later on and say, I think um, this particular game is undervalued in the terms of the net asset value or the price of the sub DAO token versus the amount of growth opportunity or the amount of assets that it has. So you might try to optimize for earning, um, for owning more of a specific game than being exposed to the entire space or if you are what i call the player investor which is what i am i own a lot of nfts i i play games directly then you might participate directly with nft assets and one of the things that we are providing later on as a service is for players to be able to stake their nfts with yield guild so that we in turn can let our player base use those nfts and earn yield and we can um, share the revenue on that side so that they don't have to kind of um, trust other people with sending them their um, assets and hope that they get it back and they get the feedback. So we're, we're going to en enable basically a kind of trustless lending marketplace so that we can, uh, we can um, have more people sending their assets to us and we can put it to work with our huge community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Indeed, there's just so many ways to, to get involved, right? And uh, I think the way you put it is, is very, very nicely done. Uh, YGG itself can be thought of as like an index of the metaverse, both the assets as well as the activity uh, that, that tracks all of that. And then if you're interested in a particular game, uh, perhaps what I, what I get from you is that either you can, if you, if, you're, if you think that the game itself can capture a lot of value, then the governance token may be the way to go. Uh, if you think the, the game is creating and distributing a lot of value, then you can go with either the sub DAO tokens or, or the YG, YG, yeah, where, where like you capture the um, activity, uh, yeah. of the value of the activity that, that's being uh, 
uh, driven. Of course, all, both of these uh, are not mutually exclusive. And in fact, YGG also invests in some of the these assets into the treasury, right? So yeah. how do you actually balance the different activities of uh, YGG, right? Between, I almost feel that there are a few arms, right? There's kind of like yeah. an investment arm that looks yeah. into assets and land and new games. And, and then there's there's like a, a research arm kind of like for strategies and, and management. Yeah. And then there's like a, a really kind of like operational scholarship arm. Yeah, that, that is actually super accurate. So the investment arm almost works like an early stage VC firm, right? Um, except that like we, we take a look at tokens and NFTs. So um, there are some games that we bought into private sales or pre-sales. Um, Illuvium is one of them, for example. Um, Ember Sword as well. So even if the games are not released yet, we bought in early because we believe in the future of these games. We believe the teams behind them, and we think that they have um, great potential. And it also allows us to get in on the asset prices at a cheaper price, which means that we can buy more of the assets when the game is out, which means more of our players can play the game, which is most important. So, so that's the investment part. And we've actually invested in um, 10 games already. So it's not just Axie. As I said, it's um, Illuvium, um, Zed Run, for example, Guild of Guardians, um, and um, a couple more. Um, Can I just cut in here? Does the investment arm, does some sort of active trading as well? Do you actually sell uh, Xyz and sell the tokens when you think it's time to take profit? Or is it kind of like more for productive assets? We've never sold anything so far. So we we actually, like we're not built as a kind of trading firm or we're not an NFT hedge fund. We only buy assets if we think that we can make them productive. Right. Um, yeah. And, you know, that said, it's not that we would never sell them, but we would first try to make them um, productive within our community. And it might only be if, you know, maybe if we kind of feel like there's really a need to take profit or if we feel like the player um, support is waning, that we might sell assets. But we actually haven't really sold any of the assets so far that, um, that we have purchased. Hmm. Hmm. Understood. Were you going to uh, say more about the other arms? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you were talking about the operations arm. So this is primarily an Axie Infinity, which we are investing in very, very heavily to provide Axies to um, scholars from around the world. So a lot of our concentration is around Southeast Asia and Latin America. Um, we are looking for some partners within Africa as well. I think these are kind of these are the three areas that we can really build a huge um, scholarship operation that can impact a lot of lives around the world because in a lot of the countries here i would say that there are limited um, uh, earning economic opportunities and some of them might actually really benefit from the economic opportunities that the metaverse provides or in our case specifically axie infinity and then you know we have um, a product team that will be creating um, our community mining the app who will be doing the lending marketplace in the future. So basically they'll be providing more and more services on top of the, the, the huge user base that we are, uh, we are acquiring. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think one of the features or products I'm, I'm really excited about is the, uh, the quests to, to actually earn more of, uh, the YGG ownership, the guild itself. Right. And, yeah. uh, from there you can scale with, uh, more community engagement. Yeah, that's right. So. Um, YDG, I guess, is unique with um, in uh, most of today's protocols in that we don't have a liquidity mining program. So instead, we we have what we call a community mining program. So 45% uh, of the token supply is reserved for the community, but you have to do things inside the community that accrue value to the community itself. So for example, it might be playing one, one of our partner games. We might create a quest system on top of Axie Infinity, for example. So they're not only earning SLP, they're also earning the YGG token. And then we can also do this with other games that we're partnered in. And this is our preferred way for our community members to, um, to uh, achieve, to earn the token. Um, a lot of our community members won't be able to buy much of the YGG token because uh, maybe they don't have a lot of money to invest. But the, um, what we're telling them is that when the system is live, people can invest with their time and their skill and their contribution to the community instead of money. Because, um, yeah, we're serving a lot of community members who, frankly, don't have a lot of money to invest in to start with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that really balances out uh, the economics and ownership of the, the guild itself, right? Because uh, to me, 
I almost feel that this uh, is quite a different distribution compared to the DeFi DAOs, where while you might have liquidity mining, uh, in essence, still the whales can actually acquire yeah. more of it because they have more capital. But in this case, because everybody has the same amount of time, <laughs> you, yeah. you can only perform the quests like uh, however long it takes for you to do so, unless you are somehow 100x more efficient in, in accomplishing these quests with some bots or something. Uh, yeah. so, uh, uh, inherently, like the distribution of the guild ownership, I expect will be, we expect it to be more equitable, right? Yeah, I think so. So we've um, we've raised a bunch of um, money from um, a lot of different um, VC funds, for example. But this is because um, we wanted to invest in the assets that we, then we can provide to our player base. And overall, we've actually set aside a larger percentage of tokens, 45% to our community than what we have um, set aside to, to sell to, to our VCs. So we do want to be really a player-owned guild in the long term. And, you know, it's going to take a lot of work to get there. But I hope that, um, yeah, I hope that we can really make it happen. The, the, the analogy I make is that what if Uber made their drivers um, equity uh, owners, share, shareholders um, from the very start? I think, like, you know, a lot of Uber... In the early investor shareholders have been, you know, a lot better off by the rise of Uber and other gig economy products. But you, you cannot really say the same for the gig economy workers themselves. And I, I think that is the great promise that Web3 brings is that because tokens are software, it's easy to distribute. There is this um, great opportunity that we let the people who are working on the protocol, also the owners of the protocol. And this is something that really excites me the most. Yes, I think that's really the core ethos and, you know, we're called the Web3 Native podcast as well. So that's that's what we're really excited about, right? The Web3 Native models. Uh, at the same time, if I may just play the devil's advocate a little bit, uh, you know, having a, a more player-owned distribution, does that kind of like justify the, the percentages that, that the guild takes more though? Because uh, I think we compared ourselves to Uber and I just looked up the numbers uh, a while ago. So uh, Uber, for example, takes uh, uh, the player or the, the workers get 75%, uh, Grab gets 80%, uh, Gojek, the workers get 90% even. So actually YGG is at 70% is uh, on the lower end of the scale, uh, lower among uh, even compared to all these other players. Uh, is, is the argument that this is offset by the fact that uh, the guild itself is owned by the workers and therefore it's okay to take a, a bigger percentage? That's a great question. So actually, it's not that we take 30%. We only take 10% and the rest is distributed towards the community manager and the player itself. So it's that revenue sharing plus the ability to own tokens as a form of equity in the guild itself, which means that they have not only um, really good earning um, potential from um, from the ven revenue share of, um, of the games, plus they get to be an owner. So if there is upside, if there's financial upside in the guild itself, a lot of that upside will accrue to the to the token itself. And the, the players um, who, who are doing the work for the protocol will be earning that upside. I think that's a really important concept because you know i mean the revenue will come and go but ownership is what really builds wealth in the long term mm, mm. definitely definitely uh, and if i may add as well i think from our experience in the web3 ecosystem is that firstly uh, even whether or not people think it's fair it's transparent in the first place that you know this is the percentage that goes right? rather than having a middleman that you don't yeah. know how much they are earning you don't know how much the whole platform is earning you don't know where is it going here we know exactly how much and it's uh, pre-programmed so you cannot kind of take it away and uh, because the model itself and even the code often is is open source technically if we are being exploitative uh, another guild could presumably come up that gives hey i i'm giving you 90 percent or something like that, and then maybe they can get network effects. It's all kind of like fair game for people yeah, to participate. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and I love the transparency of it because at the end of the day, people have choice, right? They may go with another guild that maybe is giving a better deal or one that is a better fit for people socially. Um, and yeah, I, I actually really like the freedom of choice for, uh, for people here. Yes, so for YGG itself, are we going to kind of, kind of give people that kind of level of choice, right? Because we're going to have sub DAOs. Are we going to give them the level of flexibility? Because at one level, I think at the game itself, there could be different uh, metas or, or different kind of like management styles that yeah. could form different sub DAOs, maybe even different economics in terms of like how much commission do community managers or, or the guild charges are, how much 
a freedom are we going to give each sub DAO? Okay, so what we want to do with the sub DAOs, and we've done this with only one game so far, League of Kingdoms, is that um, we uh, we we minted the sub DAO token and we let the active players in the game buy in to the sub DAO token at, at at the at cost to us purchasing the land. So instead of buying land, they basically have fractional shares of of the land estate that we have. And um, now they are the ones that are kind of running the game, and we set up a snapshot page for proposals on how to um, govern um, the, the the game and our assets there long term. And this is generally how we'd like to do it with our sub DAOs. I don't think we'll be rolling it out like immediately for each game because I mean it takes a lot of work into spinning up a sub DAO as well. The game has to be earning. There has to be a decent amount of I would say revenue to go around, and there has to be a game lead. Um, that can really that is really committed to the game, but as um, as we spin up these sub DAOs, um, we actually want the players to be the ones deciding the fate, um, the collective fate of this game and the assets in our games. And YDG itself will probably earn. Uh, now we probably own more than half of the sub DAO token, but this is more for economic purposes. Like um, we want the the value to eventually flow up to the to the YGG token. With um, with the active players being more like the managers, think of it more like employee stock ownership, right? Um, that said, um, it's not for YGG or the Greater DAO to determine how the game is run. We actually don't participate in the sub DAO um, governance as a as the core team. We let the players decide. They may ask us questions. We may give our opinions on something. But with the proposals that have passed on the sub DAO, and there have been two so far, in, in, in in YGG LOK or League of Kingdoms, we actually did not um, force anything. Like we, the community proposed it, they vote on it. If it passed, we execute on it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's very good to hear. Uh, just a quick one. So, do you think we'll see actually multiple sub DAOs for a particular game? Uh, maybe. Oh, by... very possible. Yeah. Very possible. I I could see a a future happening wherein like a a game gets too big in terms of users and then they split up into multiple YGG sub DAOs for the same game because they may be like rival sub guilds, but they still want to be connected to earning the YGG token via community mining, or they still like being under the YGG brand, but have competing guilds inside. So yeah, like the core concept is that we are a guild of guilds, right? Mm -hmm. We are not like one particular guild because you don't want to be in a guild with 30,000 people. You want to be in a guild with 30 people that you really like, that you go to raids with. And these are the people that you care about. And yeah, we want to have the opportunity for each people with their own small squad to set up their own sub guild inside YGG. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a one guild to rule them all. Or rather, the, guild, the meta guild to rule them all. <laughs> meta, guild is, meta, meta guild is the perfect description. Nice, nice. Well, I think, okay, with, with this view of the, the YGG's growth, uh, let's just then zoom out a bit and go to the market, right? Because there are some really interesting questions there. Uh, I think one major one is that how correlated is YGG to the overall crypto market? Uh, because I think play to earn, even with like Axie, having started off in the Ethereum ecosystem, uh, most of the players actually cash out to ETH, or I don't know whether they do so in stablecoin, but it's still in the Ethereum ecosystem, right? So yeah. uh, to what extent is this kind of like correlated with uh, crypto adoption, like the ETH prices, uh, the NFT prices, if, if like speculators are still coming in, right? If, if those go into like a bear market, is it going to affect the whole play to earn model? Or is this kind of like a hedge because there's some real world adoption? I expect there to be less and less correlation over time with the general crypto market because um, each game will have its own kind of economy. And um, yeah, the kind of ebb and flow of money will actually depend more on each game economy, as we have seen in Axie like in, in the last month, where it has been kind of trading differently from the rest of the economy. That said, you know, there is a lot of capital sloshing around in crypto. And if the organic growth of a particular game ecosystem is spared by basically speculative capital, from the greater crypto market, then you are more correlated with the crypto market as a whole. So I would say that um, you're probably less correlated with, for example, BTC and ETH, um, because people are looking at these from kind of a macro point of view. And for these games, you're looking at actual game economies, right? Continuing along the, the line of the, the market, right, with the correlation, I think, as you said, we expect it to be less correlated. Uh, 
what about like, actually in terms of the uh, NFT financialization, right? Because that's kind of like very closely tied to to DeFi and the progress of the development of DeFi products, right? Things like lending and borrowing of NFTs, you know, a fractionalization and indexing of NFTs and even uh, appraisals of what the prices of NFT should be, the prediction markets for that. Uh, will then the adoption be correlated with that? Or maybe it's, it's part of like the whole wave and you need the full ecosystem to continue to mature. Yeah, I, I I really I'm in, I'm really interested in the growing trends of combining NFT and DeFi uh, pro, um, kind of protocols. So, for example, are you able to collateralize your in-game NFT and then uh, maybe uh, get some borrow some money out of that either as a stable coin or ETH or or a game token and then put that to work in the economy? I think we're very early um, in in that stage and. The, the SLP system that um, Axie pioneered is like the, uh, I would say one of the earliest, very successful kind of infusion of DeFi and NFTs. But yeah, I just expect a lot of innovation to come from this, from multiple teams in the space. And yeah, I'm just really excited to try them all out. Mm -hmm. What else are you most excited about? What do you think are some really crucial components? I know one of it is, of course, the lending or the staking of NFTs, yeah. right? Which YGG will definitely use a lot of. Uh, what else would be part of the core products you think? Yeah, actually, lending and rental is actually a super core component that I think is um, um, underbuilt so far. There is no um uh, there's no ERC standard yet uh, for yeah. for lending. For Why example, do you think I that is yeah. It's it's just hard to build. I mean, I mean, it's hard to build a standard that is supported by everyone in the industry. I've been actually um, with a working group with an EIP proposal for doing this, but it's kind of hard to push the momentum through. So it hasn't happened yet. Um, but you know, like for example, I have land. I have a bunch of land. I want to be able to trustlessly lend it out. That's just how things work in the real world. And if you can do that trustlessly with smart contracts, then I think the economic activity would boom so much. Um, within uh, within the metaverse as well. If it's easy to lend out items, clothing, weapons, avatars, right? So yeah, that, that is something that I'm super excited about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we do see quite a few startups actually trying to tackle this space around uh, NFT, I, I guess, lending or renting. Uh, and would you say it's it's more of a coordination problem around standards rather than a technology problem? Because is it kind of like, or is the technology implementation also still unclear? Um, it, it, it's not a technical problem. It's more of a standards adoption and product adoption problem. Even if you get the standard passed, um, you have to talk to the projects and basically have them adopt this new standard. And there's a huge amount of inertia in basically adopting a new standard. So it takes a, a huge amount of coordination across like certain, a lot of independent actors in the space to push something through like this. Yeah, how do you think this is going to play out? Uh, you know, will we see basically one leader push it through? Could it be, you know, are you planning to push it through? Because if YGG is the largest guild, whatever you adopt as the standard could become the standard, right? Or how else are you thinking about it? We're definitely kind of pushing through the EIP 2615 standard with the working group that we have. That said, in the short term, we think that the lending will happen per game rather than as, um, as basically a smart contract standard. It's just easier for the game developers to basically create their own delegation system um, to their liking, rather than having to wait for a standard that may come out in you know six months or two years, right? Mm -hmm. I see. So for now, we'll probably see more organic adoption uh, by game. So it's up to the kind of uh, networking or uh, abilities of each of the protocols. Yeah, that's right. I see, I see. Yeah, well, really excited to see how that plays out, right? Because like you said, such a crucial component. Uh, another crucial component is, of course, scaling. Uh, and I think we really saw that with Axie uh, because initially it was on the Ethereum mainnet and there were a lot of issues with gas and transaction costs. And eventually they moved on to Ronin, which yeah. as I understand it is more or less a permission network <laughs> run by them. And while there's certain trade-offs, I think the players are happy to do so. And there's interoperability and transparency uh, yeah. that kind of like serves the purpose and the core priority is still the gameplay and the economics. Do you think we'll continue to see each game almost, like you said, adopting their own uh, lending and borrowing standards and also their own infrastructure, their own side chains, their own chains just to run these games? Well, I think um, it's incredibly hard for each game developer to run their own sidechain. 
I mean, Axie is unique in that they're actually, I would say, more crypto native than game native as a developer. So um, it, it was really within their core strengths to not only have their own marketplace, but also have their own side chain as well. I don't expect all developers to be doing this. So yeah, there are, um, for example, solutions like maybe a Polygon or um, the, um, yeah, there's a bunch of others that um, that you can use uh, to basically scale your um, scale your game's performance because I mean, it, if you want to be in the Ethereum network, if I guess you want to rely on the security of um, of Ethereum, but at the cost of uh, basically performance, right? And a lot of games need more performance, so you may be going to Immutable, you may be going to Flow, you may be going to Wax, you may be building on top of Ronin as well. It's up to each game to really think about what kind of trade-offs they are making. Mm. Yes, and, and you know, as you said, you almost have to be a crypto developer to understand some of these trade-offs, right? And ideally, we may want the developers to come from the gaming world and so that they can really focus on, on building the best games. So for, for those kind of developers coming in, what would your advice be in you know the game design and picking infrastructure, all these different things, right? It almost feels like we need an advisory arm or <laughs> playbook that, so that people don't worry about this infrastructure or uh, should they, do they need uh, some in-house core team members who are crypto natives and really understand it? Yeah, I think you really need the combination of people who are really good at game design to people who are good at crypto economics. I think that is that is where the magic really lies. Like you can't just have a team that's coming from one of the large game companies go into crypto then expect them to do well because they don't understand how uh, token economies work, um, for example. And at the same time, if you're purely crypto native and you might not be used to like how hard it is to actually build a game that is polished with good balance, um, then you, you have like um, con content, content, you're balancing um, servers, you're adding live ops, op uh, live operations. But it's actually hard building games and it's hard building um, crypto apps that are successful and combining both is actually a very difficult task. Yeah. I can just imagine a daunting task because building a hard game is difficult enough. Now we have to figure out all of the, the economics, the mechanism design, as well as the infrastructure. It, it's almost miraculous how we have a few precedents on that already. I almost feel that uh, the, the games that are kind of built, they kind of like, it's harder to get the crypto expertise. And so therefore, like that is the starting point, right? Uh, how will we get to the point where, you know, it's more like the mainstream game developers coming in, like what, what else do we need to get us to like the global adoption where almost every game developer thinks of play to earn as one of the potential options when they are building the game. Okay. So for game development, one of the largest, uh, I would say reasons that, um, games became easy to make was because of game engines like unity, like unreal. And also now there are a bunch of companies that are starting to develop middleware that can put the kind of crypto part in your game. Um, yeah, so th there's a bunch of companies that are targeting this. And I believe that over time, um, it will just be as simple as, you know, booting up Unity and then adding a crypto module to your game. It might be, um, yeah, one of these middlewares that will, will help developers easily do this. Are there a few that you would like to just shout out or name to, to support or promote? Um, uh, the, the, well, Stardust is one of them. Um, I think it, it's still very early on, um, but I've talked to the founder several times and he's also been building in the space for a few years. Um, there are a bunch of others, um, but yeah, I actually, I think Immutable will also be building a suite of tools for developers apart from the, um, from the chain that they have um, for games. And yeah, I think um, Polygon as well, they have Polygon Studios that will be a, set, a suite of different tools to help transition um, game developers to Web3. So yeah, a bunch of companies are really attacking this from different angles. Awesome, awesome. So if you are a game developer, uh, please look to some of these tools for technical help. And I think we always like to focus on, on the builders and founders in the space. So what else would you like to share with aspiring entrepreneurs and builders in NFT gaming or play to earn? I, do, I know we've covered a lot about the technical components and, and economics part. Uh, I love I love to hear a bit more on the social part, right? Like, you know, having built through times where, like you said, you may need, you may need to persist, or you may need to pivot. So, how do you sustain through the difficult times? You know, still make a living, decide when to hang on, decide when to pivot. 
Yeah, um, uh, I would say that it's been a long time coming for me to 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 build YGG that has been growing incredibly quickly. I've I've been in game development for 18 years, and you know it's it's a really tough business. When I got into crypto, it was like the last few months of the bull market then and surviving 2018 to 20 has actually been really difficult. So you, I think you really need to have conviction about what you're building. It, it would have been really easy for me to hang up because, you know, like we were running out of money. We didn't know when we would see the light at the end of the tunnel for NFTs. But yeah. I, I just How really you, believe you have a site income or something. <laughs> um, let's just say it was incredibly difficult. <laughs> it was incredibly difficult. We we took on different kinds of projects um, just to survive. Um, we were really unable to get um, much investment money going then. And yeah, we just had to hang on however we can. And, you know, there have been partners alongside us that actually helped us. Um, along the way and make it successful. A lot of the names that are actually big in the space now, a lot of them like went together through the bear market with us and help us um, go through it together. Um, and yeah, like a, a lot of the people who stuck in the space, you see, you saw them building in 2018, 2019, where th when times were pretty tough. Now they're massively successful. I mean, these guys, they, they deserve all the credit in the world. Indeed, indeed. So. Not to forget the tough times as well when when we are in a good time. Uh, of course, just to wrap it up on, on a slightly lighter note than maybe, you know, what are you most excited about right now? Just to finish it off, you know, what, what games are you most looking forward to and what's uh, catching interest? Um, I'm excited for Guild of Guardians because um, it's an ARPG. I love Diablo type games. It's going to be mobile. It's going to be guild based. So it kind of checks all of the boxes for me. Um, I'm also looking forward to Ember Sword because it, like it's they're building like a full proper fantasy MMORPG um, with a kind of natively crypto based economy, which is just incredibly exciting for me as a lifelong RPG player. Um, yeah, uh, Star Atlas is also super interesting because they're trying to build kind of the uh, kind of biggest space MMO, which has been you know really ambitious, really hard to pull off. And if they pull it off, it's it's really going to be massive. And yeah, apart from that, I'm look forward, looking forward to seeing all sorts of innovation. I don't really want to be seeing clones of Axie, right? Because mm -hmm. you know that, that that makes like slightly different. Um, I want to be able to see innovation in gameplay, in tokenomics, in pushing play to earn forward. These are the games that are we're looking forward to supporting and investing in. Indeed. I think that's a clear call to action for all the builders out there and people who want to participate in DAO, come and innovate in this space, right? So many tools for you. And in fact, I'm, I'm sure Gabby yourself uh, perhaps would love to mentor some of the early stage founders as well. Yeah, yeah, Indeed. absolutely. Um, especially in Southeast Asia, I think that the success of Axie and Yield Guild will bring along like a new wave of founders in Southeast Asia that will have access to mentorship, that will have access to funding, from you know from long hash and some of the best DeFi and nft investors around the world so that is something that i'm most looking forward to because traditionally it had been um, not that easy for uh, for southeast asian founders to have that kind of access to capital and i think this kind of spotlight on axie on yield yield on plater and has blown that wide open yes there's no better time come and build this space <laughs> all right to, to wrap it up, thank you so much, Gabby. And would you like to just uh, share some contact details? Where can people reach out to you and find out more about YGG? Uh, um, yeah, so the main way to look for us is in Discord, discord.gg slash YGG. You can also go to Twitter, twitter.com slash yield guild is where you can find us. Um, and yeah, from there, I'm very easy to find um, on, on Twitter or on Discord. Yeah, just, just talk to me and say hi. Awesome. Thank you so much again, Gabby. I hope that's been an insightful session for everyone who's listening and uh, for us as well. Thank you, Shika. I'll see you in the metaverse. Thank you. See you next time. <laughs>